Welcome, everybody, to a chat with Eri Berry and Zach Phelps Roper. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Good, good, good. You're um, currently in Phoenix, Arizona, aren't you? Yes. Um, originally from Topeka, Kansas, uh, because you are a member of the Phelps family, uh, as the uh, you're a member, you were a member of the Westboro Baptist Church, and I'm assuming people who are uh, listening to this already know a little bit about it. But um, we're going to do basically a two-way interview, I suppose. You know, I'm going to ask you some questions. You've got questions for me. Um, but the first question I have for you, Zach, is how are you? I'm feeling very good today. Um, I got a little bit of a cold, but I'm okay. I'm going to be seeing my sons here in a few days. Cool. Gonna make really a trip up. Well, I hope you have a really, really good time. First I suppose, I mean, you, you've said that you, you're happy to answer any questions um, about your life with Westboro and your life since. Obviously, we're not going to talk about other people because they haven't given their consent to be spoken about, which is fair enough. Um, so the first question after just how are you, the, the first uh, relevant question, I suppose, to the, the subject of the interview is, um, so have, have you managed at all since leaving Westboro have you managed at all to get in contact with any members of the family that are still with the church? Well, the thing is, is that when someone leaves Westboro, you know, is excommunicated or departs of their own accord, mm -hmm. the members of Westboro are supposed to cut off all contact with right. that person. And so, um, although I do have a few people who are associated with Westboro but aren't necessarily members, I am able to get some information about my family and friends from Westboro through these other channels. So you, you have ways of finding out, you know, what's going on, who's doing what and, and everything like that. But um, I'm, I'm really, really sorry that, you know, you know, it's a huge family. It's an absolutely massive family. And, um, do you know, I, I, I think even I would have difficulty keeping track of everybody. I mean, I come from a big family, but certainly not as big as yours. But um, it's it's difficult to work out who's who. You know, it's it's like a massive community in itself. I was. You told me, I think, previously that you're Wiccan. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about what does it mean to be Wiccan? Well, I was a Wiccan. I don't consider myself a Wiccan anymore. Um, it was when I was eighteen. I was. I did consider myself a Christian, um, but I was very. I sort of. I was conflicted, and I didn't agree with all of the practices and all of the rules. But I read a book about Wicca, and the the whole respect of nature and working with the environment not against it and considering yourself part of the system not in addition to the system really appealed to me and to me I, I love the pagan and Wiccan philosophy I still think it's a really good ideal philosophy um, I just don't believe in this in the supernatural anymore and I don't believe in um, gods or goddesses I do think it has symbolic meaning for a lot of people and it did have a lot of symbolic meaning for me and if that works with people that's great but I think if I were to follow any kind of philosophy if I needed a framework by which to live my life it would be based on Wicca I suppose that buys into my love of science as well because it's all part of a big machine that's how I see it all the universe is one big machine I agree with you wholeheartedly the universe is a massive system. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to understand or break it into smaller parts. Um, it's very difficult to predict how systems work, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, you're right, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Massive organism. Mm -hmm. It is quite amazing. So, so just, to, just for the purpose of anyone listening to this, some of these questions I've already put to Zach. He's already answered them for me personally. I just think it's a good thing for the audience to hear. So I'm, I do apologise if we've been through this before. Um, one of the questions I had, and I think maybe some other people were thinking as well, is how does Westboro justify using the King James version of the Bible when it's very different from previous versions? Um, especially as God says he is eternal and does not change, even though that's in the changed version. So what would the answer to that be? My grandfather never actually explained why he thought the King James Version was superior or the only good one. Mm. I think 
occasionally he has said that like later more recent versions of the Bible have completely butchered the meaning of like for instance he he only mentioned this one example but beyond this I think it's it was just his preference but he said that when Jesus was speaking to a woman at a well and she was trying I think she was asking for him to to help her get water from the well or something he he said basically he ends up saying that that she she I think he says something like where's your husband and she says who are you talking about? And she, he says, yeah, you have had five husbands or something. Basically, in that story, <laughs> my grandfather said that when it's interpreted, when it's translated, I guess, basically it made Jesus look like a wimp or something, like he was apologetic or something like that. I probably butchered that pretty badly. But maybe just for convenience, I'll just restate my answer. Um, my grandfather does not have any concrete reason to believe the King James Version is superior. Um, I think I was watching an interview with your aunt um, Margie, I think her name is, Margaret? Yeah, I think I remember hearing her say something along the lines or it might have been someone else along the lines that if this is the version that the world is circulating now more so then it's God's will. Yeah, um what has it been like in the UK since COVID began last year? Are you guys still on lockdown or what's going on over there? Uh, a lockdown has eased a little bit, actually. We've been told that as from the 17th of Monday, we can now meet up um, and hug each other, we've been told, outside. Um, and <laughs> there's been some memes flying around I've seen where people are like, um, I didn't want to hug you before and I don't want to hug you now. But, um, yeah, it's... I think because the um, the new variant is starting to make its rounds here as well, I don't know how long that's going to last. I really would hate for another wave to come along and more people die and, and get really seriously ill. Um, so I'm hoping that people won't go silly with this um, change of rules because we tried it last time lockdown was eased and it just had the detrimental effects of it had to be locked down again but to be honest I've actually really enjoyed it personally because I'm a, I'm a bit of a hermit I'm I'm not a sociable person I have to, I have to admit I'm someone who likes my own company and I like the company of my, my cat and my wife and I love watching the big bang theory and um, playing Skyrim and doing writing and art and I think that this last year because I've lost my mum and my, my other cat recently was put down and and everything and I've had the operation and the recovery has been really really bad but I don't think I would have been able to cope if I had if lockdown hadn't happened and I don't mean that in a horrible way because I know that it's really affected a lot of people and people have lost other loved ones is that if I'd still been going to work or I'd still have to go out in massive crowds I would have not liked it at all it would have um sent me in a, into a huge panic attack but being at home has actually helped heal I think because I like being at home sorry that's a long-winded answer <laughs> I'm a homebody too mm -hmm. home is definitely where the heart is you can just be yourself it's great uh next question I've got is um this is one thing that's um, always bothered me a little bit is what is in layman's terms i think most people know what it is really but what is repenting because i get that the definition is to say you're sorry you won't do it again etc but no matter how much you say sorry it doesn't change the past and at what point or how many chances does somebody get to repent before they say right that's it you can't repent anymore you're going to hell you need to be put to death you need to, whatever so what <laughs> What is the score with repenting? And isn't that God's will, whether you do something or not, or repent or not? Are you asking if Westboro will forgive you, or... or Just maybe the, the philosophy that they follow, the, the approach they have to repentance. If someone steps out of line there, do they get, what, three strikes, or um, does it depend on the severity, and um, by which system is that measured, or... Well, um, I would say it's it's a very subjective thing, honestly. The members of Westboro, if they think that you're if that you're actually apologetic and that you take 
you know, like, basically, like, if you have any, if you show any sort of resistance towards their judgment, then they're not going to think that you're being legitimately repentant, right? To them, repentance means you change your mind and you change your actions because you realize that you were in the wrong, right? I mean, oh, okay. Okay. So there's the difference. So if you're still defiant and say, no, hang on, I think I was in the right because X, that's not repentance, that's justification for why you think it's not even a sin in the first place, even though they think it's a sin or something. Yeah, basically, if you go, if you go against their idea of what's right, you're going to be, you're automatically in the wrong. It's all, they try to say that everything that they do must be unanimous. So like, if they want to, if people are thinking of excommunicating someone, it has to be a complete church decision. Everyone has to agree or disagree, I guess you could say, and say, okay, we'll, we'll let them have another chance or whatever. But yeah, it's very subjective. It's, they're, they're just people. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, like, <laughs> sometimes my mom goes a little off the deep end. I read Libby's, my cousin Libby's book And (laughs) my mom sent this really wordy email with, like, all caps in it and stuff, like, chewing out Libby and Libby's parents and stuff. And, yeah, I remember my mom sending those kinds of emails. It was always very, um, because they're very paranoid, right? Because they say that if we're not right with God, God's going to, you know, take away the candlestick, so to speak. He's going to take the the holiness of the church or whatever, and he's going to just let go of us and let us go to hell, right? Mm-hmm. So they take that very seriously. Yeah. yeah. Repentance is, of course, very subjective, but, yeah. Mm. A little fucked up. Yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that. I mean, I think you made a good point there as well, is uh, a lot of people forget, like especially when we see the way that Westboro is portrayed in the media, which I, in my view is actually very unfair because in their mind they're not doing anything harmful, they're actually helping, even though the rest of the world doesn't see it that way. And I think what a lot of people don't realise is that they're human too and a lot of the time they have the kids with them and I've seen one where um, a car window got smashed. I mean, seriously, people start hating on these people and then doing mean things to them. I think some of the best ways to, to deal with it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is to listen, but say, look, I don't agree, but I get your point, move on. Or maybe even behave in a way like, you know, to say, you know, just be courteous to them, be polite to them, or ignore. Because I think that, you know, that's better than causing somebody harm. You know, just because you don't like what they're doing, you think what they're doing is causing harm. So, you know, don't fight fire with fire. What are your unique hobbies? Unique hobbies. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I mean, well, writing is my first love, absolute first passion. It's in my very essence, and I cannot, if I don't live, if I can't write, then I can't live. Um, art is another one. Um, let's see. Uh, I like to gather knowledge. I like to just find a topic, and just sort of collect knowledge. Um, what else have I? I wouldn't say I'm a hoarder, but I tend to go, oh, that'll come in useful, I'll keep that. And it never comes in useful. <laughs> um, I used to do horse riding when I was younger, like really, really avid horse rider. Westboro say they're not trying to win souls, I've heard them say that several times. Um, but they but they seem to clearly be trying to do just that, because they're telling people what to do, repent, stop sinning, etc. So this appears to be a contradiction, and please could you possibly comment on that? Well, if they are able to convert people to being obedient servants of God, people who were meant to predestinate to do so in the first place, that's fine with them. There's nothing wrong with people turning to actually listening to them and following their advice, but their primary purpose, in no uncertain terms, is simply delivering a message because they consider themselves to be prophets. And the prophets, usually they forewarn or Mm. prophesy destruction Mm. or disobedience. And in order for God to be able to 
execute his wrath, they have to deliver the message and warn people prior, because otherwise God would just be destroying people uh, willy-nilly, and people wouldn't see any kind of uh, connection between their actions and the, you know, the words that they say, you know, their sins. They don't see any connection between their sins and the God smacks, right? The curse of God, the wrath of God. They're trying to force people to see that their actions are, in fact, going to have consequences. And that that's what they're... I mean, in so many different um, words in the Bible, for instance, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1, it says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions. Mm-hmm. In the same way, um, like... I don't know. It's a way for them. To, it's a way to show the ju- the mercy and justice of God by you know forcing. If people can see what the rules are, then they're not ignorant about what's going on, and so the the justice of God is therefore more obvious. But of course, they would say that even if someone isn't warned about you know that they still deserve to go to hell because God predestinated you to go to hell, right? But they tend to think that, yeah, it's their job to warn people so that God is, in fact, um, you know, that they can. Yeah, I think that verse that you mentioned about lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and I think I've seen Steve Drain quote that before, is to me that seems a very convenient paragraph. And the people who wrote the Bible, I mean, yeah, it was 1,000, 2,000 years ago, whatever, is... They're not stupid, you know. They know that God can't speak for himself, so people have to speak for God. So, of course, they're going to put that in there. That's just my view, personally. Um, so, this this is sort of continuing a little bit for what you said about predestination, is that Westboro have said that we aren't in charge of our lives. God is. And your uncle said this to, uh, to Russell Brand on his show. If we aren't in control, then why bother telling us to repent and lifting up voices like trumpets and showing transgressions, etc.? If God controls us, he is making us sin and blaming and punishing us for what he has done. Why make up rules, make us break them and then punish us for it? (laughs) I know there's a lot of words. (laughs) Sorry. No, I get exactly what you're talking about. This is a common common complaint by people who learn about absolute predestination that Westboro preaches. Uh, and actually, that was one thing that I started to realize was bullshit when I left Westboro, um, because I felt like if there was a God who would predestinate you to be a sinner, and you know what I mean, like just to, why would He create you just to destroy you and to punish you and to make your life miserable, and then you know it claim that the reason why you are getting punished is because you are being held responsible for actions outside of your control. Yeah, that's complete bullshit to me. We don't throw people... (laughs) uh, We throw people in prison who commit crimes, not not before they do that. You know, people who have voluntarily... Like, you know what I mean? Like, a person who goes out and steals, I don't know, a lot of money or, or commits rape, you know, they are held accountable for their actions. Um... But, yeah, it's completely unfair. It's completely unfair. And, of course, they would say, they would quote, a, a, there's a quote that the Apostle Paul, as they call him, spoke. He says, Nay, but, O man, but who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed him, Why hast thou made me thus? And it's just basically saying God can do whatever he wants, and you just have to suck it up and take it up you know <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah it's like you said it still seems like really fucked up like um it, it's like you know the saying oh god hates gays well why did he create me then you know he's responsible for me and another thing is people saying is if he didn't want adam and eve to eat the fruit from the tree of life or whatever it was why put it in there in the first place set them up for failure and if god is everywhere why did he not know what that snake was doing and, um, yeah, why didn't he step in, you know? You make, a, you make an interesting point. I never heard anyone say, why didn't God intervene when uh, Satan or whatever the snake was trying to tempt them to commit evil? Yeah. And, yeah, it's a lot of unanswered questions that the Bible doesn't really satisfactory, 
satisfactorily resolved for me. No. Yeah, no. it's um, it, to me, um, I think somebody I saw it on um, I don't I don't know if it was Facebook or whatever. But someone had taken the, the first page of the Bible in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. They'd scratched out in the beginning and put once upon a time. And if the Bible had began with once upon a time, we'd be reading it like a novel. You know, and people give credence to the Bible because it talks about real places. But then so does Spider-Man, you know, and but nobody believes that. I mean, if, if people were to unearth comic books at 500 years in the future, they probably think that Spider-Man actually happened, you know. And so it's just because it was several hundred years ago doesn't mean it was in a completely different dimension. Doesn't mean that, um, you know, it was when Lord of the Rings was around. <laughs> It, it still was very much the same place it is now, just with less technology and different rules. And um, But people weren't stupid. They knew about psychology. And somebody at work once said that they thought that Jesus, and this was a good analogy, I thought, Jesus was the Derren Brown of his day. He was very smart. He knew how to work people. He knew how, he was a, he, he knew how to work a crowd. He knew how to get people on his side. And he was able to fool people. And that's possibly how it will happen. He may have ex- he may have existed, but that doesn't prove he was the son of God. A claim is a claim. It's not just because someone says they are doesn't mean they are. Okay. So I'm curious. Um, you said earlier that you've been re- conducting research. What have you been researching lately? Uh, some true crime, because I do a, I run a true crime channel, which I need to get back into, actually, is what has been intriguing me lately is unsolved mysteries. And... The one I I need to edit, actually, I did it months ago, is about a man who died skydiving. And his death still remains a mystery. Now, it's my opinion based on the evidence, not just gut feeling, but I don't really go on gut feeling, I just go on the evidence, is I think it was murder. And whoever it is has not been held accountable, and that to me is not acceptable. And then I was looking into things like the Jameson family who died under mysterious circumstances and other mysterious deaths. Lars Matank, he hasn't been seen since he fled the airport in Bulgaria. I, I always yearn for justice, not just for myself, but for other people. I think people should be held accountable for their own personal responsibility. And if someone has taken that man's life, they're, they're out there, if they're still alive now, because it was about 19 years ago, still living their life and not being held accountable. That, to me, is just not acceptable. And also, the family haven't had that closure. I've heard that there are signature strengths that people possess. My signature strength is forgiveness and mercy. Mm. It sounds like yours might be justice, Mm. which is incredible. Well, I, I try not to let it blur into revenge. I try not to let it blur into holding a grudge. It's okay to, I think forgiveness is more what you do for yourself rather than for the other person because you need to let go up here otherwise you're going to torture yourself. But to tell that person, it's fine what you did. You're, you're giving something to them whereas to let go in your head is your, your thing but they need to deal with what they did. Um, if they get sort of validation and reward from the people they've actually hurt they're probably going to end up very smug about it and like I've got away with it in a way reconciliation is not easy Uh, my next question for you is why does the church not require evidence of their beliefs or for their beliefs well for for many people who think in stage blue like Westboro um, evidence isn't as important as faith. And um, to them, they think that, well, they were taught that the Bible was the absolute truth and that their interpretation of it was also absolutely true. And because they were, this was their culture, this was their social conditioning, they never learned to think critically, even into think in stage orange, which is scientific and experimental, right? Um That's when people start to ask questions about the authority of the Bible, the authority of the Pope, the authority of the Church, and things like that. 
So to be honest, the, the reason why they don't require evidence and they, it's because they have, this is their conditioning. This is what they were taught from being young children and they don't know anything else. Mm -hmm. And it's like uh, a little child who learns to believe in the Easter bunny or Santa Claus because mommy and daddy said that those, they exist. Yeah. They just never learn to question this. Mm -hmm. And I suppose if, if, if it's something that's been ingrained in you since you were very, very young, it becomes part of your very life. And that to question that means to question everything. And it could rock the very foundations of what you find secure. And I suppose people, uh, like members like yourself, who have either been excommunicated or have left, have probably grappled a lot with that. And losing family members as well, I can't imagine, is devastating. But um, as you said, when people leave, they can reach out to other people that have left for support, you know, and um, understand that, you know, you've made a lot of friends outside now as well. I think evidence is important because it speaks for itself to me. Um, and I'm a, I'm a very sort of factual based person, and but I, I, I don't mind asking why, but I was brought up on the adults know everything, always take what an adult tells you as quote, quote, gospel. And I was, I was raised Catholic. Um, I went to a very, very religious school, but they only taught us, they didn't actually teach us the Bible. They told us what the Bible said in easy terms. So they didn't quote verse, verses or anything like that. But when I got older, I realised it wasn't quite as nice as they made out. Um, and lots of contradictions. So, How did you first hear about Westboro? Oh, I think it was when I heard, uh, when, I, when I saw Louis Theroux's documentary. I think it was the second documentary I saw first, and then I went back and watched the first one. And then I saw about, you know, your cousin Libby and what she was saying to Louis and everything. And I thought, this is both heartbreaking, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that they're being free. But there comes a lot of, you, there's a price to pay for it. Um, and then I researched quite a fair bit of it, actually, I have to say. So lead, leading on from the question about um, God punishing people for what he's made made them do is if being gay, because I am, um, is what God has determined. And if we should rejoice in his judgments, shouldn't their signs say, thank God for gays? Well, they say, thank God for everything and anything that happens. Um, but they still, that, that doesn't detract from their belief that if you are disobedient, then you're still going to go to hell. I don't know. It's hard for them to reconcile a lot of this stuff. There's no satisfying answer. No, there isn't. There's some things <laughs> you, we can debate from here until t until the rapture. And um, I don't think we'll ever come to a conclusion. What's your favorite video game? Skyrim. I oh, that's right. Tell me that. Skyrim, Skyrim fan. Um, I keep saying to the wife, right, I'm off to Tamriel to kill some dragons. Do you want me to bring you back some skooma? Sometimes I can um, be trying to do one thing and I accidentally steal something and then I get people attacking me. But I think the game is just brilliant. I know a lot of people use a lot of mods and console commands, whereas I like to play it just as it is because to me that's how the game was meant to be played. And I've heard that mods and console commands can mess it up. You know, it can, it can mess with the codes and everything. I'll never get bored playing it. Never get bored. This question is, why specifically homosexuality? There are 613 commandments and I've not seen Westboro protest fashion shows for mixing fabrics or restaurants for serving shellfish for working on Sundays, etc. So what makes a sin more grave than another, basically? Well, they probably would come up with three things to answer that question with. I guess the first one may be to say that in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, or Acts chapter 10, um, there is a passage where the Apostle Peter has a vision, or a dream, if you will. And basically, at the end of this dream, um, God tells him that what God hath cleansed, do not call common, which is in reference to animals. He said, "Arise, Peter, kill and eat." There's all these animals sitting in front of you on like a on like a picnic blanket or something, as you imagine. He says, "I can't eat anything that's unclean." 
And then they say that, you know, God, what God has cleansed, don't call common, which is to say that there is no longer a dietary code. Mm -hmm. So they would say that, that passage basically made it so that there's no problem with whatever diet you choose. Mm -hmm. You can eat plants or animals of any kind. Nothing is unclean anymore. That's the first thing they'll probably tell you. Um, the second thing they'll tell you um, with regards to homosexuality, why they make such a big deal of it is because they say this is the issue that's on the front burner. This is the one that people seem to be disagreeing with the most. You don't have murder or pride parades because everyone believes that it's wrong, which is what the Bible says, right? You're not supposed to kill people, thou shalt not kill. But they say that people are becoming tolerant of homosexuality and like transgenderism and things like that. And that that's why they make such a big deal of why they focus on that because nobody seems to be on God's side in that matter. But lastly, and probably the most satisfactory, why is it that they like, for instance, why do they have, for instance, why don't they get upset about people mixing fibers and things like that? Right. You know, clothing fibers, they would say that there are two different kinds of laws in the law. In the, you know, in the law of Moses, you have the ceremonial law and the moral law. In the ceremonial law, they say that such things as, you know, don't mix fibers, don't eat certain kinds of animals, etc. That this is really more symbolic or allegorical, I guess you might say, as opposed to, like, literal which in their mind basically says that these the reason why you don't mix fibers is is it's a, it's symbology. You don't mix what is righteous with what is unrighteous. It's just a symbol, right? And they would say that when Jesus when Jesus passed away on the cross, it said that the the veil of the temple, which is like this huge curtain basically that covered the holy of holies. That, that, that thing was written twain or cut, you know, it ripped down the middle, which is, in their mind, they say that the ceremonial law is no longer necessary. You don't have to sacrifice animals to try to be obedient to God because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. And therefore, there is no need for the people of Israel, the children of Israel, to, you know, to sacrifice animals anymore. There's no reason to not be able to mix fibers together. This was all just symbols of what it means to separate the good from the evil, the righteous from the unrighteous. Mm. That's what they probably would say, is that the ceremonial laws no longer apply, but homosexuality is one of the moral laws, or mm. what they would that's what they would argue anyways. Yeah. I don't even know if the term ceremonial law or moral law are actually written in the Bible as such, but that's what they talk about. That's what they taught me. Mm. The thing is, a ceremony still happened. That that building, whatever it was, could have been split down the middle, but that doesn't mean that that's it. There's no more temples because ceremonies still happen. The thing is, I never understood the whole sacrifice thing as well. If you're going to sacrifice an animal, the poor animal doesn't have a say in it. If you've done something wrong, sacrifice an animal is just doubling down on that. That's something really bad. So I think if you've done something wrong, the best thing you can do is try and make amends for it and um, not just say you're sorry, but show that you're sorry. You know, and if there's no way of showing you're sorry, just make sure you don't make the same mistake. Going and killing an animal saying, right, someone's got to die or something's got to happen to somebody because of what I've done now. To me, the idea of sacrificing an animal to, you know, save the people is, is like taking the virgin and throwing her in the volcano to keep it from erupting. This is the kind of, <laughs> it's just, it's just a very, um, it's a superstitious way of living life mm. where it's, or things that don't really, it doesn't really make any sense. If you throw someone into a volcano, it's not going to stop it from erupting. <laughs> and that's what the whole, that, that's what it seems like. It just seems like, uh, it just seems ridiculous to me. That's all. I don't like the idea of sacrificing animals either. I'm vegan. Yeah. They care about animals. What are your political stances? Um, Tell me about the UK. Um, <laughs> in the UK? Uh, well, uh, I... Do you know what? I was thinking of this the other day. Um, a couple of elections ago, um, Ed Miliband was the Labour leader. And at the time, the Conservatives were in power, so our Prime Minister was David Cameron. Now, I was in two minds because I've always been a Labour 
person, like the working person, you know. But I didn't like Miliband, really didn't like him. I wasn't a conservative, but I did like David Cameron, so I was conflicted. When it came to election, I remember walking up to the uh, office where I was going to put my vote in, and I still didn't know. So I said, F it, and I voted green. And I voted green ever since. To me, I don't care who it is. It's more the party that I'm voting for. But at the same time, there was just something about Miller Band that I just did not like. And even though I did like Jeremy Corbyn, uh, when he became the Labour leader, I still voted green. And I'm still going to vote green. Green sounds... Is it liberal, would you say? It's to do with the environment. It used to be called Greenpeace. Um, mm. And they th- they do things like that. They want to get rid of Trident. Um, I think you know the like nuclear um, defence up in Scotland. Um, they want to preserve the natural environment. They want to cut carbon footprint, stop whaling, and try and preserve as much of that natural stuff as possible. Plant trees, increase the number of bees, get all the flowers out and everything. Just try and you know celebrate nature. That's what I would do. So I think I'm just gonna even though I do still kind of in a way support what Labour does. I think I'm just going to keep voting green. I gotcha. Very cool. Be clean, go green. I like it. What is the issue with Jewish people? Um, They call Jews alive today murderers and say how bad they are, but going back to the Bible and what your uncle said, wasn't Jesus' death preempted and wasn't it what God wanted? So... Why shouldn't the sign say thank God for Jews? Why are Jews alive today responsible for what happened all those years ago anyway? Judaism is a religion rather than a race and those who are Jewish did not necessarily have ancestors who were Jewish and vice versa. Hmm. They may not understand the subtle difference between being perhaps a Hebrew by birth or uh, or Jewish by like religion or by heritage, or they might not understand the subtle difference there. Mm. But they will. What they what they often say is that God. Um, well, it doesn't really matter what group of people they target. They all they think that everyone but them is going to go to hell, and they say that when the when the Jews of the time were trying to get Jesus crucified, they basically said something to the effect of his blood or Jesus's blood, may his blood be on us and on our children. Of course, that's ridiculous um, that the actions of those people 2000 years ago should have any saying on the, the merits of the, you know, the Jewish people living today. Mm. It's, it's ridiculous, but, that's worse before. <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I, I really, really don't get it. I mean, isn't there another Bible verse that contradicts that and says the sins of the father do not pass on to the sins of the son? I think I've heard it both go, go both ways. To punish one's children and grandchildren for the actions of the, the patriarch and the matriarch is quite ridiculous. Mm. It's not a form of justice. Because everybody's, you know, got their own life. Everybody's responsible for their own life and they're not responsible. Nothing that one person did affects another, you know. That's why I don't understand when people think, say things like, you've shamed the family. I'm like, no, if I've shamed anyone, it's myself. You know, if uh, and if I've done anything that is shameful, that is, but I'm not ashamed. Like, I'm not ashamed of my sexuality. And to be honest, I really don't care what other people think. Coming out of the closet when I was 18 was the most euphoric moment of my life and I mean I've never had a high since like that I don't think any drug could top how wonderful that felt maybe I'll get into that in another conversation but that's a long story <laughs> are you a fan of the Saw films? sorry? are you a fan of the Saw films? no don't uh, like torture, don't like hurt, don't like pain don't like that sort of thing, no another uh, entry into the move into the series is coming out in theaters in a few days if it hasn't already called spiral from the book of saw <laughs> i think because uh, the wife has seen it before even though she finds it a little bit difficult to watch but it's not so much the torture it's the twists and turns in the story and about you you've been duped by somebody who you thought was legit and all of that and how all the stories link up that's what i like but i don't want to see people being tortured no even though i know it's make believe even though i know it's not real the whole thing is that it just no it plays with your head can't do it i actually love that series <laughs> i mean the, the the certain things that i 
that I can watch and certain things I can't watch. And I think sometimes things need to be a certain way for a reason. I think with the Saw films, yes, they're there for entertainment purposes. Um, like one of the most um, horrible scenes I saw was um, a film that Jodie Foster did just before she did The Silence of the Lambs. She did a film called The Accused. Have you seen that? <clears throat> it sends a very good message, and I'm, I think this film should really be shown to a lot of people learning about it, is where um, a rape victim is often blamed for what happened to them because of how they dress, because of how they act, because of that the fact that they were drunk or they were high. I don't care if someone is dressing provocatively. I don't care if someone's drunk. I don't care if they're unconscious or flirting with people or dancing with people. If someone says no, they say no. And if you don't check the, with them that they're okay with it, don't do it. The f a film that a lot of people like in law enforcement and that do need to watch even though it is it's not it's, i suppose it's fiction but it's based on quite a lot of um, gang rape stories where they have to prove it and the victim is the one that's shamed quite a lot of the time and it's wrong i understand that i agree too uh, many people challenge Westboro saying that god is about love and Westboro says he's not however they claim to be quote loving their neighbor by telling them that their sins are taking them to hell so what is and isn't love what does love, according to God's standard, actually look like? Love, according to God's standard? Hmm. Well, I suppose maybe we can talk about the love and the hatred of God. Uh, essentially, the love of God is unmerited favor or unconditional love, which is bestowed on a few members of humanity, which is why God will send them to heaven and let them... You know, live a live a, an eternal life of peace and happiness, whereas the hatred of God is the determination to send someone to hell for the rest of their existence after they finish their life on earth. But um, yeah, it's a pretty shitty definition of love, to be honest. <laughs> it's not a it's not a very loving thing for someone to to do that. It's not a very loving thing. They don't believe that God is... Com they believe that there are parts of God that has love, but it's very conditional. It's like, the, it's like the love that my parents have for me. It's very conditional. When I stopped believing as they did and started to question things and to, you know, they cut me off. They had want nothing to do with me today. And... Um, it wasn't because of anything necessarily wrong that I did, but because they believe that it's right for them to, you know, to not have anything to do with me. That's what God's commandments say. Yeah, the love of God is very conditional. It's not, the love that the Bible taught me is not really love at all. It's just conditional affection. Conditional favor, maybe? Cause yes. Because I think affection is, when I think of affection or love, it's hugging, protecting, um, feeding someone if they're hungry, clothing someone if they're cold, taking someone under your wing that needs it, showing someone a bit of compassion, putting someone's needs above your own. That, to me, is love. There shouldn't be conditions to that. I mean, I suppose if there's any condition, it's if you hurt someone or hurt me, or and it's intentional, I might not feel the same about you. But I know that like people like my mum, when she was alive, she used to say, you know, if you did something wrong, I would turn you into the police, but that doesn't mean that I'll stop loving you. That's the difference. You know, and and that's kind of how I was brought up, that if you do something wrong, you need to answer for it. And that's kind of how I believe, you know. What's your favourite quote? Um, I think now, especially since I've lost my cat, and my mum, it's the Alfred Lord Tennyson, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And I was thinking of that recently, is that, yes, um, I, I've heard a lot of people say they don't want to have pets because they don't want to go through the heartbreak of losing them. But then I'm thinking, but what about them? You know, they, they, they get a good life out of it if you're good to them. And all the time they're there, they've brought so much joy and love to your life. Yes, losing them is painful, but in a way it's worth it because I would rather be heartbroken a thousand times and lose a thousand beloved pets than never have had them. 
because I know I've done my best to give them a good life. They may not have had that. I mean, they could have, they could have had that or even been sport rotten by somebody. But even being sport rotten to me is not like being spoiled is not always showing love. It's lavishing, giving someone too much. But if you give them, you know, shelter, warmth, um, their food and their water, health care, like with cats particularly, if, you know, if they want affection, don't say no because they don't like it. But at the same time, don't try and push affection on them. They don't like it. So I think that's my new favourite saying. Nice. I like it. I think losing my mum last year and then capping it off with losing my cat it was kind of like my my mum's death really just eviscerated me it just tore me open and then with losing my cat it made me think do you know what and I thought about this at my mum's funeral that everybody said such amazing things about her I thought my mum was amazing she was just an out of this world she was my idol she was my inspiration everything she was my adoptive mum she didn't have to take me on, but she did. And she lived for children. She absolutely lived for children. She would have, if she'd lived now, she would have seen her fourth great-grandchild just born. I think, yeah, I think my last question is, um, it's quite wordy, sorry. Um, why are Westboro telling us about God? Why isn't God doing it himself? I think this is what I touched on before. It's always told through a medium, never direct contact. And Westboro may argue that God has told us through the Bible and that Jesus, but there's little to no evidence that Jesus existed, let alone was the son of God. Even then, being the son of God means he was just a messenger too. Still, the Bible is contradictory and whether Jesus was a God or just his son. The Bible is just a book and was written, copied, reproduced and translated by people. We had to chop down the trees and slaughter animals for their hides, etc. to keep making Bibles. It has all the hallmarks of a man-made institution. Well, they would probably tell you that it's it's faith. <laughs> it's all about their faith. It's about it's they, they believe it to be true. They say that the Bible is both the claim and the evidence. And there's nothing really much you can do to argue against that point. They would say that the holy men of old were moved by the whole, like, men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the Bible. And, you know, it's just, like you said, the claim and the evidence being confused. Yeah, I mean, like, um, one thing that I've never been able to grasp, and this is one of the first times I ever questioned it, I think I was about eight or nine, and when we were at school, we are talking about how God died for us. I remember thinking, it's a bit like you said about throwing the virgin into the volcano. How does that result in that? I don't get it. What did this? He didn't actually die because he went to heaven. It, he just bodily died. How did that help me? What was about that that helped me and other people? And someone said he sent the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, hang on, hang on. So the Holy Spirit didn't exist before that oh yes it did right okay well why wasn't the holy spirit there wasn't it the holy spirit that impregnated mary wasn't it the holy spirit that um prompted moses to write the old testament what what was all what good did that do how did him dying save me i don't get it and they're like well it opened the gateways to heaven okay fine so people before that didn't go to heaven they happened to be born at the wrong time but then we're told that we still have to follow the rules and then we'll, otherwise we'll go to hell. But then we also get told God will forgive us so we can do anything we want. But we can, you know, there's all these, it's like a flow chart. But, you know, have you sinned? Yes. You know, it's just to me, it was just like, did, 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 I, I still I still think it's a bit like, like, it's like saying the man across the road saved me by drinking a beer. How did that affect me? What, 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 what was that? It's that kind of question, like, what? I'm sorry. <laughs> What's healthcare like in your country? Um, well, it's a myth that it's free. It's not. When we get paid, um, I know that in America you file your taxes. And here, tax te- gets immediately taken out of your wages, immediately. Um, you only have to file taxes if you're self-employed or over certain circumstances like a d- company director, that kind of thing. Um, some of that money goes to the government for healthcare. Um, Prescriptions are not free. I pay a monthly amount so I can have as many prescriptions as I need, but per prescription in the UK is £9 something. Dental isn't free. It's about half the price of private. Ocular and hearing is not free. 
you have to pay for that to the point that I'm actually a private patient for my eyes because on the NHS or National Health Service I would have to still pay um, and I don't get as good contact lenses. Uh, the NHS is usually very good with things like uh, cancer and heart and stroke and diabetes. If it's something that's not urgent, you might be waiting a while, but they do the best that they can. And they have really, really just so many people have literally sacrificed themselves, given their time and their energy and their lives to helping people with COVID. People have contracted it and died who work in healthcare. The hospital I regularly go to called Guys and St Thomas's in London. That's national health, but it's so state of the art. It's brilliant. And I have a team of people in the endocrine uh, department looking after me because um, I think quite a lot of my viewers might know that I have a rare gene and I need to be monitored. But I also the monitoring is part of research. So I'm glad to be part of that. The healthcare I think, is as good as it can be. And it's it's full of heart and full of caring. And I do certainly think that our government need to wake up and listen and give them a pay rise because they absolutely deserve it. They really, really do. We've been showing our appreciation as much as we possibly can and raising money. And uh, Captain Sir Tom Moore, uh, Moore, who passed away from COVID, he was 100. He raised so much money and people are doing things in his honour to help keep raising money. So, yes, fine, we get taxed and we pay for certain things and the government pays for certain things. But raising money has been something that we've all done in wake of covid and um they they do it because i mean they don't get paid huge amounts of money but they do it because that's what they do and like i was saying about you being a nurse it, it's it's a vocation the the people who looked after my mum the amount of times my mum went into hospital with with infections and they were so good they saved her life so many times they're lifesavers you know nurses like yourself you're lifesavers they they couldn't save her this time, but this is because you can't you can't always. It's not that anyone's done anything wrong. It's just that the, the the strength of the body is stronger than any any external force. And it was my mum's time. She had COPD. We've learnt a lot from COVID. It it was a, the healthcare system was a lot different to what now to what it was two years ago. It's just my my opinion that governments should look after the health and well being of their citizens first and foremost. It, it it shouldn't be a it shouldn't be a business. Sorry, just went off a bit. No, it's okay. I'm learning about them. It's good. Um, are you going to be visiting here? Mm, not anytime soon. I don't have any plans yet. I want to go visit Japan someday, but I've never been outside the country. Um, no. I think because we're kind of running out of time a little bit, is um, I would like to, if it's possible, at some point in the future, reschedule and maybe do a, another little chat, because I'm sure that quite a lot of viewers might might like to know a bit more about you and um about how you came to be leaving the church a little bit i know that we can't really talk about other people and that's fine because we need to respect other people's privacy but they might want to talk about you know what what led you to to leave and everything like that and i think it's fair for you to tell your story and if, and i think in the comments below if anyone i mean if anyone's got a question for you zach you'll be happy to to answer i mean of course with you know within the boundaries of confidentiality it's been really good i'm so sorry i've kept you for much too long um, it's okay I, I need to go to tamriel and slay some dragons sounds like fun <laughs>